There's such a good spirit in here. It's so weird. I was. I was <laughs> there's usually a good spirit in here. But no, I'm sitting out there and I'm, I'm greeting people and I'm usually trying to hold the door for people because that's something I like to do. And uh, people weren't even making it in the building because they were too busy, excited about seeing each other out on the street. And that's. Uh, this is a really cool family to be a part of and a, and a real yeah. blessing to be a part of. There's such a, a good spirit of authenticity here that's that's really cool. Um, so I just wanted to say that. But uh, we are continuing a little series that we began um, a couple weeks ago. And John uh, started us off with the Beatitudes. And we're talking about what it means to be kingdom people. What does it mean to be people in this kingdom of God that God has invited us into? And... Um, those sermons on the Beatitudes are, are fantastic. Uh, Baron put them up on uh, YouTube for us and on our, uh, you can find the link on our page um, at HarborChurchSeattle.com. And so well worth um, revisiting and listening to. And I'm taking us to the next kind of place in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which kind of focuses on what this means to be kingdom people. And it's on salt and light, so I just want to read that passage for you. If you've been familiar with it, I ask that you just reopen up your ears because God might say something new. So, uh, Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says this. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and I praise your Father in heaven. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is living and active, and that uh, you have things to say and to do with us today. Uh, as John said, you've got business and you want to conduct it. And so, Lord, uh, we open up our ears and our hearts to what you have to say. Uh, Lord, speak speak to us. We trust you. We love you. Amen. Amen. You know, it's, it's funny, as we were kind of outlining this series, this passage came up for me, and, and John was giving me a hard time because a couple years ago, apparently, when I was guest preaching here, I got to preach on salts and light. And apparently it was this phenomenal sermon that I even <laughs> remember. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so I went digging through my uh, horribly coordinated archives of sermons. I could not find it for the life of me. <laughs> and so you don't get that sermon, which is probably a good thing because, the, as I've said, the Word is living and active, and God has new stuff to say. And it's kind of funny. My, um, my preparation process, the commentaries that I read, they're, they're all the same ones that I've been reading for years, and yet uh, somehow God shows up and speaks and brings different stuff to my attention. And this sermon feels completely different. And in part, it's because of who you who you all are and this community and, um, and what God is doing right now. And so I'm excited to look at this word again with you. Uh, and I really got stopped in my tracks in the very first two words, which didn't get me very far. And I was terrified because I thought we'd have like a four hour sermon if I kept going at this rate, but we won't. Um, but uh, the first two words of both verses 13 and 14 in reference to being salt and light uh, kind of stopped me and it, it said, you are, you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Um, and it's kind of different. It, it means that you and I, if, if we decided to follow Christ, we are already salt and light. And uh, that's not how normally the world works. You know, when I, when I became a pastor, they didn't just say, well, you're a pastor now. I went to school and I learned some skills and I got some proficiencies. And all of us have done this our whole life where we go and we learn some things and we perform some things. And then once we're able to perform them, then we can do them. In second grade, it was multiplication tables. And I had to go home and learn them. And if I could learn them and do them, then I could multiply and uh, then you get into a job or your career, and, and when you can do something, then you are a teacher, or then you are a bookkeeper, or there, then you are able to do this thing. <laughs> and yet Jesus is sitting here talking to a bunch of people and says, no, you, you already are. He says to us, you already are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And most uh, religions, most self-help processes, most philosophies basically say, 
Go and learn how to do this. Here's five easy steps, and that's actually would make for a better sermon, maybe actually with three points. John has been teaching me, we all think in threes. So there's three points for how to be more salty or more lighty, but that doesn't work <laughs> because Jesus says you're already salty and lighty because, well, I'm, I'm in you. Um, and so that just takes that right off the table. And um, it's a funky thing, this God's love and grace thing. Because it totally undoes us, and by Jesus dying on a cross, welcoming us into his family, and saying, come, be with me, and then I will be with you, God moves in to our lives. And then, because God is living in us by his grace, we're salt of the earth, like God is, and we're light of the world, like God is, because he shines through us. Now, I don't know how you're feeling today, but rarely do I feel very salty or light. If I uh, were sitting where you are and uh, the pastor like me said, hey, how many of you feel like the light of the world? Actually, let's just do that. How many of you feel like the light of the world right now? <laughs> A few little lights. <laughs> most, of us, most of us don't feel very lighty. Um, and I don't feel very lighty. And so this just feels completely weird to me because I'm, I know my shortcomings. I know the areas where I'm a mess. And I don't feel like I have it all together yet. But it's crazy. We're made in the image of God. God uniquely crafted each of us. And, um, and each of you and myself bring something to the table that reflects God's goodness and beauty to the world. And um, even though sin is there, even though we've made poor choices, even though other people made poor choices that maybe messed up our story a little bit, uh, there's still something in us that is quite beautiful and reflects the Lord. Um, and Christ is in us at work to bring that out. And so we are valuable and precious light and salt for this world. Uh, and he knows what he can do with us, even if we don't see it yet. Um, and as I was praying about this, this kind of image came up, and I'm going to ask Deborah to put it out for us. I think that we're a little bit like uh, that car. Um, maybe we're sitting in a lot somewhere, and we know where we've gotten in a few accidents, and we feel some dents, and and we maybe had some neglect and the, the windows are all dirty and we're not street worthy for bringing this kingdom of God to the world. Um, and yet there's somebody who saw that car and said, oh, that's a piece of work. I can do something with that. That's, that's going to be amazing. And, um, and he started on a project. He, he took that thing home and began to clean the windows and work the dents out and uh, tweak the things that needed to get tweaked into the right place. And that is, is exactly what God is doing with us. He sees more than we see when he looks at us. And he says, I got a project and I'm going to take that thing out on the road and you and I are now the salt of the earth and the light of the world and we're going to shine like that car. Um, and that takes a bit of trust when we don't feel like that. So what? So how do we how do we go about doing that? What does that look like if it's not to try to be more salty and to go, okay, I'm supposed to be salt. I'm going to be salt. I'm going to be light. Um, here's what it boils down to. And I think Harbor does it exceptionally well, the folks of this church. It means be you. Be who you are. It's funny. I, I've been around church and ministry for 20 some odd years now and this church does it better than anybody I've ever seen of having folks be who they are, where they are, in the midst of whatever story their life is in right now. And when we try to fake it, when we try to put on a Christian face, when we try to act the way we're supposed to act because we're Christians, and when we try to do the things we're supposed to do because we're Christians, and when we do the things that we ought and we try to be salty and lighty, somehow it gets in the way and it actually blocks out the light. Um, yet Jesus says, no, go, be who you are. I've made you who you are. So be salt and light, and I will shine through you. Um, it's funny when you're in a hard time and, and somebody says, oh, how are you doing? It's really tempting to go, oh, man, I, I'm blessed. I'm just blessed. I'm good. And it, uh, or when we see something wrong in the world or wrong in us, oh, everything happens for a reason, right? God's in control. And we kind of throw this up and it, 
and yeah, but inside that may not be what we actually feel like. And, and I think all of that actually gets in the way of the salt and light. And Jesus says the one thing to not do with your light is to put it under a bowl. And so we put up this facade and it, and it actually blocks out the light. Christina and I bought this picture um, on our trip to Vancouver and it's, it's gorgeous. And then we put it up on the wall and um, we had these sconces up there that the builder had put up in our house right next to it. And we realized absolutely no light is hitting this picture. And we're going, what the, this is horrible. What? We need new sconces now because that wasn't part of the plan when we bought the picture was to replace light fixtures as well. <laughs> Um, and so we took them down and we realized that these little ceramic things that were supposed to be sconces had been put up before they ever painted the house. Oh, God. And then they painted with their big water spray, whatever thing. And so they were completely covered in paint so no light could get out of them. And I think if we paint ourselves to be something that we're not, it actually does just that. It blocks out the light that Christ wants to give. So, but that's a risky deal. Um, it's hard. It's hard to be real. What if we risk it and we put ourselves out there and we're not accepted or uh, folks don't like us or silence emerges when we say something? Uh, and yet that's the challenge of this passage. It's not to be salty or lighty. It's to be real and it's to be out there and to be visible. Uh, some of you do that incredibly well, and I thank you for your courage, and it's teaching me to do that right now. So um, so let's get into what salty and lighty looks like. What, why did Jesus bring up salt and light of all things? He was a master teacher. He used common everyday elements that we could all relate to to talk about things that are heavenly and divine that we don't get to uh, see and understand very easily. And so when Jesus said, uh, are you the salt? To the world, or when he said you are the salt of the world, was he saying you are a wonderful little condiment that you can find in every restaurant on the table there for people to season their food? I think he probably meant more than that. Um, we're much more than a small container you can get in the grocery store for two dollars that you can put in your closet and pull out occasionally. So, for a little exercise in figuring out more of what Jesus meant, I want you to imagine with me that we're all part of a family, uh, or that you're in a family of maybe six people, you live in the desert uh, in Israel 2,000 years ago, and uh, it's livestock, agriculture, farming, and so you have some veggies over here, and you've got some animals over here, maybe a chicken, and a goat, and uh, some cattle, and... Um, it's time for dinner, right? So you go out, you get the chicken, and you prepare the chicken. It's perfect. Family of six, yeah, we can get by on chicken and some veggies. That works out. Maybe some matzah. Uh, and then you eventually get tired of chicken. And so you go, well, let's have goat. And so you butcher the goat, and you realize that you have about 25 pounds of usable meat out of the average goat. Trust me, weird research that pastors do. 25 <laughs> pounds of average of usable meat that you can get out of a good goat. And so you prepare it for your six-person family. What is that, about three, four pounds, those of you who like to cook? Uh, and you realize you still have 21 pounds worth of goat. And so you invite your 40 friends over for dinner, right? That's how that works. And then you realize, you know, we're tired of goat. Let's have the cattle. And here you have 500 pounds of usable meat. So you invite your thousand friends over for dinner at your house. No, you would never do that. That doesn't work. Um, and that's where salt comes in. you got to store this meat somehow. You're in the desert. You don't have ice. You don't have a fridge. What do you do? Well, you can dry it. You can just put it out in the sun. It's nice and hot. Uh, but it's going to rot while it sits there and dries. But if you salt it, well, then it doesn't rot while it's dry. And then you end up with uh, beef jerky. So we go to Costco to get our beef jerky. Apparently the Israelites have a lot of beef jerky. Um, but salt stops that process of decay. And I think that's some of what Jesus was getting at, was uh, around us, this world is a broken place, and we bring our own brokenness into it. But it's a world where things seem to decay and get worse and rot. And somehow Christians get the role in this world of being in places and stopping that decay from happening, making things usable and, uh, and good and life-saving and life-giving. 
Um, speaking of which, another place that salt got used was medicine. So while I'm butchering my cattle, I get a big cut on my arm and it's probably going to get infected. I'm in a very dusty place in the Middle East. And uh, one way to stop that infection from happening, you just salt it. Man, I am so thankful for triple ointment <laughs> antibiotic cream, but apparently they didn't have that. And so it's better than losing an arm. But um, sometimes uh, being salty is, is a bit hard, but still it's better than losing an arm. And Christians are there to bring health and wholeness to situations, even if it is messy and hard. Salt was a vital, vital uh, thing. It was a good commodity. Uh, the word salary comes from salarium Latin, uh, which meant uh, salt. And it was because Roman soldiers were given some of their pay uh, as salary, which was either money to buy salt or salt itself, so that they could get by. Everybody needs salt. Everybody in our world needs salt. We need the salt of each other. And so Jesus says, go. This is who you are. Your role is to be salt to the world. Um, and that's a pretty amazing calling, an amazing thing that God does in us. So what does that actually look like to be scattered as salt throughout the world? Uh, maybe you're that person who recognizes the value of people and can call that out and say, you know what? You're an amazing coworker. You're great at this. Uh, maybe you're just a person who works really hard and really trustworthy and is an example to the people around you. Maybe the way that you go about um, doing what you do is a blessing to other people. Like uh, Karen was just sharing about how she bought that house and got to meet the previous owners. They were somehow salty to her, lighty to her. Uh, maybe it means standing up against a K on a systemic level and saying, you know what, this isn't okay. I'm not okay with this. I need to stand against this cause. I need to give money towards this thing. Um, our folks who volunteer, uh, I think of Halloween at Holman. Like, it's a neighborhood. It's, hollow, it's celebrating Halloween, and yet somehow they want a church because when they've experienced that church to be there, which is you all, it's been salty and light for them to have us there. Uh, that's cool. And the crazy thing that Jesus says is if you if you don't get out there and use your salt, you're going to lose it. It's, it's going to lose its saltiness. I read one story of a, a merchant who had uh, bought a bunch of salt and he was going to import it into this country and he uh, realized he'd get taxed on it so he decided to hide it from the government by buying a small village hut and filling the hut with all the salt until he could get it moved. And um, as it sat in that hut, uh, it was in contact, the bottom of it was in contact with the dirt and it, it gradually ruined the saltiness of it. Um, the Dead Sea is full of salt but you can't use it because it's got too many impurities in it and, it and it gets ruined and it's just worth throwing out. So here you are in a place that needs salt, but there's not very much usable salt, and so it becomes a commodity. We live in a world that we just shared prayer requests, and that was one small glimpse into the amount of brokenness there is in the world. There's plenty of places that need salt and light, and that's who we are. But it takes putting ourselves out there and engaging and trusting that God can use us. So I don't know what your saltiness looks like in particular, and I don't know if it's just seeing a need and saying, well, maybe I could do something about that, even though I don't feel particularly salty right now. Um, but I know that if salt doesn't get used, it expires. I had to go check my Costco container right after uh, figuring that out. Sure enough, February of next year, there's no chance that Christine and I are going to use up our salt by then, but that's when it will expire. So <clears throat> there it is. Um, God made us for a purpose, and it's a purpose to get used, not to get stored together. Um, and if we don't use our salt, we lose it. And if we do use our salt, uh, we become saltier, and it's cool. Um, what about light? You know, light seems uh, pretty necessary, pretty vital. If we don't have light, it's a problem. Uh, but it's also a thing that we take for granted. It's kind of constant. We lit up this building before he came into it. and uh, But I have a friend who I've gotten to learn a little bit more about light. He uh, was an adult. He was in a boat accident, lost his sight completely. And um, we would go for walks and meet for coffee. And um, I'd pick him up, and it's not a big deal for us to go out for coffee and walk him into a restaurant or whatever. And then one day he goes, hey, 
that coffee shop's only like three blocks away. I want some exercise. Let's go for a walk. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, and he's working on using his cane better. And um, so we walked up to this place, and it was an hour before we got there. Three blocks. Because um, it's hard to walk without light. Even with this cane kind of feeling his way along. Um, he has all kinds of bumps and scrapes where his cane didn't hit something and something was about waist high and he smashes into it. And, um, we were walking in Everett, or we were going to a funeral in Everett, and we saw this, this guy who was walking with his cane, and it, the place just didn't have a curb. It was weird. And this guy was trying to track his way straight, but he kind of started to veer off to the left, and he found himself in the middle of the street, and a car was coming, and somebody literally like jumped out of their car, ran over, and kind of grabbed his elbow and, and helped him find his way down the sidewalk again. And, and maybe that's what it means to be light for people. Maybe we're people who come alongside others and give them an alternative and walk with them and see if we can help in some way uh, them make their way through life. Because it's kind of hard to do it. You know, it's certainly hard to do it alone. For me, um, I know Wednesday morning with uh, Larry Stone and, and the guys, that's been a light for me. We all roll in and inevitably somebody's sharing about something going on in their life and, and we find out our perspective is just screwy. Like I go, hey, I approached this this way. Isn't this great? And I sometimes share it like that, hoping that they're going to be like, wow, Chris, you're awesome. That's fantastic. And they go, knucklehead, what'd you do? <laughs> and I get to sit around and I get to listen to these older guys go, oh, man, that's a better way of doing this. That makes more sense. <clears throat> um, you ever sat in a pitch black room for very long? Not like when you wanted to sleep. That's different. Uh, but if you sit in a pitch black room, it's really hard to do anything. It's a little spooky. It's even hard to move because you know you can't trust where you're going. And yet it's a beautiful thing to just have a little bit of light around you. Because then you can see, and you can trust, and you can move freely, and you can find your way. As followers of Christ, we add light to people. That's who we are. And so how do we walk alongside people at our work? and our families. Uh, it doesn't have to be pushy. It doesn't have to be shove it down your throat. Some of us uh, think either we're not worth much and so we don't have any light to offer and so we shut ourselves down. Others of us think that we're right almost all the time and so we're more than happy to share our light with anybody. Um, <laughs> and yet somewhere in the middle of this is is us saying, I'm here, I'm out here, I'm honest, and I'm real, and I trust that God's going to work through me, and so I'll share. Um, what kind of light are we, though? Uh, that one's tricky. Um, it's a weird question that I stumbled across. What sort of light? Like, are we like that battery-operated light that you like plug into a wall on a closet so you can, you can do that, or where are we connected to some sort of light switch? And uh, the image that came up, um, partially because of uh, astronomical events of recent, is uh, the idea of the moon. And maybe I think we are a lot like the moon. Um, we live in a dark world sometimes, but uh, if you bring up that picture of the moon, um, yeah, when can you see the moon? Not very well in the daylight, <clears throat> but at night when it's really, really dark and you're in a place without any other lights, that's a grateful sight to see. It, it changes things. You know? I have this pathway I like to walk with my dog, and sometimes we end out in the evening, and on nights when um, the moon isn't out, it gets really dark and sketchy. But when the moon's out full, it's really, really nice to walk by. But if we were to go up there and land somewhere on there, we would find that that thing doesn't put off any light whatsoever. Um, it's a really good mirror. And as we stay close to Christ, as we orbit our lives around Christ, um, he's the one in John 8 who said, I am the light of the world. Um, John 9, after healing a guy, Jesus says, night is coming when no one can work. But while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And Jesus is still in the world. Um, and he's in you, and he's in me, and he's in us. And therefore, he is still the light of the world, and he can still work through that. Now I want to be a light uh, for the world. 
Um, but I don't think I can do it without Christ. My life has a tendency to be a bit wayward and flickery and, and not so steady. Um, but if I put my life in Christ's hands, light seems to pour out of it. And I think that's the model. You can take down that picture. Of the but we're good reflectors. So for the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world. And um, this is because we're following him and he has decided to live in us. What's the actual goal? It's not to become more salty or lighty. We talked about that. It's not a, a self-effort or self-help. Um, let me read the passage again, and I, I think you'll hear the goal. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp or put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The goal is not to be salt or light. The goal is to not be hidden. It's to be available. It's to be on display, uh, especially in dark places. Um, and it's interesting, Jesus says that it's so that others might see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. That implies not just speaking words that we think are salty, but it actually implies letting people see how we live, letting people see how we act, and that as we share our lives with people and as we invite them to share their lives with us, uh, they begin to see something that makes them want to praise their Father in heaven. A few weeks ago, John talked about what it means uh, when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And what struck me about it was, we want peace, we want to be peaceful, um, but this is actually contrary to it because peacemakers move towards places where there's not peace. Um, they get in the middle of it and they roll up their sleeves and they begin to make peace. Um, and the same thing is implied here. Uh, if we're going to be salty, it's going to be because we're scattered out in the places that need salt. If we're going to be light, it's usually because we move towards darkness, not because we stay together and stay lighty. Um, and for the moon, it's to position ourselves at night in dark places where people can get some light out of it. And I know that for me, this is really challenging, both being uh, honest and open and vulnerable, but also um, I'm an introvert, uh, maybe a socially capable introvert, but I'm an introvert nonetheless. And I like studying and I like reading and I like playing board games and I like watching TV. And um, for me, it's not a default to stay constantly positioned towards engaging other people. Um, that takes some energy for me. Halloween on home and my tendency would be to sit at home and uh, wait for kids to come to my door. And then maybe I can offer them something. Um, but the funny thing is when you're in darkness and as somebody who at times has struggled with depression and stuff, our tendency isn't to go find people who are light so that we can get it from them. The tendency is to curl up in a corner. And so that means as salt and light, we get the initiative. How do we position our lives? Do we reach out to people? Do we engage other people? Do we invite other people in? Do we keep checking on people? Do we keep looking to see if we can offer them salt or light? Or do we wait? We're the sent ones. Jan has been teaching us a lot about what it means to be sent ones. Um, but we're sent ones, and we're sent to scatter salt on this dinner plate of the earth, and we're sent to bring light to some dark corners. So we choose to be present, and we choose to trust that God can actually use us when we are. And the good news is, is that God does. You already are the salt of the earth. You already are the light of the world. Um, so now just go and be that. Be yourself. One more small pastoral note. John shared it with me as we were considering this. Uh, he pointed out that for salt and light, they both go a long ways uh, with just a little bit. Um, salt's really good if you put a little bit in every dish, and it's not so good when you dump. Um, I used to make breakfast for my brothers. I thought it was a good way to make money. 
So I'd get up in the morning and I would, I had a menu for them to order off of. And my mom bought all the supplies. I already liked getting up early. So I made them breakfast and charged them for it. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and one day, um, being a wee little lad that I was, I made pancakes for my brothers and charged them for them and realized I had used um, salt instead of the sugar that I would normally oh. use. To, oh my God. Yeah, and so they got these salt licks. They couldn't even take it down. Um, and as I was reflecting on this, I remember as a young Christian uh, telling my views on Jesus to just about anybody in full amount, uh, whether they wanted to listen or not. And, um, and what I realized is I didn't care about that person or love them very much. I cared about Jesus and loved him very much. But um, there's something about salt that works a little bit all the time instead of pouring it all on and overloading it. Or um, driving home, I have a short little car. It's a little GTI. And um, uh, driving home, a Hummer comes up behind me with big old halogen lights. And one of these guys is overcompensating by adding the extra racks of lights. And uh, I can't see a thing. And I know that there's times in my life where in, in an attempt to help someone or just because I was overzealous, uh, I didn't give a little bit of light. I gave too much light. Um, and maybe light means coming alongside people with a lantern and saying, I'll walk with you a mile uh, as you walk in this dark place. Now that's a welcome sight. A little sprinkle of salt, a little bit of light when we're in the dark. It's just what we need. So, how do we do that? I think it's just being authentic. It's, it's resting our lives on Christ. It's trusting him. It's letting him be in us and us be in him. And then being honest and praying for people when it seems like we can pray for them and, and acting well and living out our faith in an authentic way. It's so weird because it's not something we do. It's something we are. And then God can use us. So, can we do that? Can we be that in the places that we go this week and in the weeks to come? And then one more quick question. Uh, because we all have our darkness and we all have our lack of salt. Uh, where do you need salt and light? What, what places do you need? Um, and can, can you risk asking someone else to be there with you? We're setting up some things that you can have people in your life, like Wednesday morning or Sunday night, or uh, some friends that you have out for coffee. We all need it, and um, life works a lot better when we walk with each other in it. So, um, with that, let's pray. God, thank you um, that you are at work in us, that you are restoring us, that you reflect through us, um, that you are the light of the world and that you give us salt which is so desperately needed in our lives and in the world um, keep doing it lord and use us don't let us um, curl up in a salt jar or um, be trapped in a room full of lights let us let us go out to the places that you have put us our friends our families our workplaces and um, use us as salt and light we trust that you are with us and in us amen